Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I wanna to talk to you about the normalization of the toxic shopping addiction and why it's keeping us poor. So I've been thinking about addiction a bit lately and the idea of the shopping addiction that I now recognize was, I mean, maybe I'm still in like a slight denial, but I think that I had incredibly unhealthy behavior surrounding my shopping, especially luxury shopping. I've been pondering and thinking more about unhealthy shopping addictions and pondering impulsive shopping and almost disordered shopping behaviors lately. And I actually think, and I've come around to this idea that it is actually probably one of the most silent addictions. And I actually think it runs rampant on YouTube and on social media, but it's not something that I think will really be recognized or enough people are talking about. I don't think it's something that will actually really come to come to the light. We are often talking about, you know, addictions to alcohol and various other substances, but I think shopping addiction is probably never going to be really recognized and it's probably majorly un un undiagnosed um, and underdiagnosed. And I think it's for good reason. I think that we've almost normalized our level of shopping, you know, and the economy benefits from the shopping addictions of women. These types of issues mainly affect women and this is something that even just today I was reminded of when right now at the time of filming this it's actually kind of the Amazon Prime sale. And you know big shout out to the influencers who I've seen who post a little reminder that you know if you don't actually need something you don't you don't need to be shopping the Amazon Prime sale you know like don't you don't need to feel the need to be swept up in a frenzy and seeing that I mean even myself I even still catch myself being like oh yeah because I even got caught up in the frenzy I was like oh my god like do I need anything do I need anything oh god like I should have a look like what's what's for sale and this is just very much the normalization of these impulsive disordered shopping addictions that I think a lot of women who are on social media hold. And it's mainly a problem that affects millennials. I think I read somewhere in the US alone, shopping addictions and disordered shopping behaviors affects 18 to 20 million Americans. And I don't actually think there's any real help out there for it. You know, I was in therapy for 10 years and it didn't, it didn't actually click until until one of you said to me in my comments, oh like, is that something that your therapist never brought up with you? And it's just so funny because I just realized actually, you know what, they didn't. My, my shopping tendencies were never actually challenged by anyone. No one challenged my shopping tendencies. No one did, no one challenged them, no one even questioned them. Which kind of leads me to believe that we've really normalized it. Social media, I mean, you know, think about it, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, social media has normalized and further peddled women's shopping addictions and disordered shopping behaviors and society benefits from it. Capitalism benefits from it. The economy benefits from us spending our money. So of course this is never going to be challenged. I don't believe this is an idea that will ever be challenged, but this is something <laughs> I'm going to give it a damn good shot. <laughs> I'm going to try and I'm going to talk to you about it today because if it's something that I struggled with and, and I mean, even I'll, I'll touch on a little bit later, I think I'm still actually struggling with it. It's just this idea that has almost been normalized that we need everything. I mean, again, bringing back to my example of the Amazon Prime sale, I was like, oh my God, like, do I need anything? Do I need anything? Do I need? I don't actually need, I don't need, I don't desperately need anything. And this idea and this frenzy that almost overtakes women's bodies, especially around sale time, when something is on sale, we almost feel like this frenzy that we need to, we need to, you know, quickly do something and, and quickly jump on the sale because in our minds, this is the perfect time and, and we're actually being sensible. We're being sensible and smart shoppers by shopping now and, and buying things that are on sale. When in actual fact, you're not being that sensible because you end up sometimes, if you, especially if you have a disordered shopping tendency and you didn't actually set out with having something in the front of your mind that you needed, you end up spending more money than you intentionally planned on anyway because you find things that, oh, that looks nice. Oh, I actually will need that one day. I don't know about you, but I'm in the process of decluttering my entire house. I've just, just today, it was quite liberating, but also strangely hard. I didn't think I'd find it this hard. I just sent off 60 pieces of clothing <laughs> to a 
to a particular uh, pre-loved store in my city in hopes that, that a lot of those items will sell. Let's see, fingers crossed. But I'm very much in this process of decluttering my entire life. And it's taking me a lot longer than I thought it would. But we all have so much more than we need. And we're, we're able to recognize that. But we don't actually tie it to the possibility that maybe we have <laughs> some, some impulsive and disordered shopping tendencies and behaviors that also need to be addressed. I think it's really interesting that with, you know, with the rise of minimalism and with the rise of people like Marie Kondo, you know, if it doesn't spark joy, get rid of it. I think that's all well and good. And I think those are the messages that really stick around the most. And those are the messages that were always in my brain but it's just funny, there's something that I noticed about myself. For years I was in this space of, oh, I need to declutter, I've got way too much, I need to declutter. But I didn't actually address the root of the issue. And the root of the issue was that I have too much because I have disordered shopping tendencies. I have impulsive shopping tendencies that just make me pull the trigger without actually thinking about it. And that is the root. That is the, that is the root of the problem. That is the reason why I have so much in my house that is not being used. So much in my wardrobe, so much in my, in my beauty cabinet, so much in my kitchen every room of my house is filled with objects that don't bring me joy and I don't even use you should see my junk drawers they're out of this world <laughs> I've been researching limbic marketing for the last few months now and I've been kind of toying with this video idea that I think I will eventually do but once I was able to understand limbic capitalism and specifically limbic marketing if you're wondering where you've heard the term limbic before it's actually a part of your brain it's the oldest part of your brain it's also known as the pleasure center of your brain and once you're able to understand limbic marketing and once I I understood that it almost just changed my whole outlook and it actually majorly majorly I mean I haven't recklessly pulled the trigger <laughs> since I came around to this concept I have not made an impulse purchase since I came around to the idea of limbic marketing once you understand what it is what once, once you actually understand what it does to your brain you're so much less likely to impulse shop you're so much less likely to take part in reckless shopping behaviors and and make silly purchase decisions. Marketing agencies and big businesses, big big corporations have been able to tap into your limbic system without you even realizing it. And it, I mean, call me naive, but once I realized this, it scared the crap out of me. And I can't believe I'd been fooled for so long. I think part of the reason why online shopping is so dangerous and credit cards are so dangerous is because you have this idea and you're almost tricked into believing that you are in control. There is a huge disconnect between the present self and your future self. When you pay with credit card, and this is something that I was very much <laughs> aware of, it's part of the reason I'm gonna have that video linked, I actually canceled my American Express, I canceled my credit card. I was being tricked into thinking I was in control. There is a certain level of control that you think you have when you're shopping online and you're shopping with credit cards because you know you pay for it now, but you're dealing with the consequences later. It's not something that you have to deal with now. Whereas I feel like with cash, I feel like you actually face those consequences right then and there because you're handing that cash over. With credit cards, you don't do that. It's something that you, you, know, you pay for, you wipe your hands off clean, and you deal with it later. The amount of times I saw this pop up you know, just recently the whole Taylor Swift eras tour came to Australia. When I was scrolling through TikTok and I was seeing all of the comments under people's videos trying to get tickets to the Taylor Swift eras tour here in Australia, so many people were like, oh my God, I got tickets. I paid for them on my mum's credit card. I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to figure it out later. That is such a good example of the idea of, you know, letting this hysteria take over and you just have to deal with those consequences later. They're not now's problem, they're, they're February 2024's problem when she comes to Australia. I used to have that mindset. I used to see something that I thought I needed. I've got to pay for that my credit card. By, in, by 30 days, if I be really good, which I never usually was, I'll have enough money to then pay it off. But that's, that's, you know, that's next month's problem. One other thing I really came around to the idea of, when I was really heavy into my shopping, into my online shopping, I was getting packages on a daily basis. I was getting them, if not daily, at least weekly, at least multiple times a week. And I actually, when I bought a pair of brown boots, I think it was like probably my only really winter purchase, which is crazy. A few months ago, I bought a pair of boots that I mentioned to you guys. And I bought two I bought two sizes and I returned the size that didn't fit me. And I actually st stopped into DHL. And I, in that moment, didn't realize how bad it, it was at the time because those girls, they just see me every week. And they had gone from seeing me every week to then not seeing me for months. And I walked into that DHL counter. These girls were like friends in my head. Like they knew me on a, they knew me on a first name basis. We used to chat when I used to go in to drop off my returns. And they're like, oh my God, we thought something happened to you. We haven't seen you in ages. 
well, you know, where have you been? And I was like, you know, I haven't been shopping as much. Like I haven't really been shopping at all. And I kind of came around to realizing that I had a little bit of a, and you know what was really embarrassing is they actually finished my sentence for me. One of the girls behind the counter was like, oh, a little bit of a, a shopping addiction. And we all kind of laughed and I was like, yeah. And you know, I just think it's so funny that at the time, I didn't think it was a shopping addiction. I thought I was in control, but clearly everyone around me, the girls at THL, for God's sake, could recognize I had a problem. And you know what's sad? I walked out of that shop and I was like, oh, like I really love them. Probably not gonna see them anymore. But yeah, I, I think it's so interesting. And this is, this is the thing about addicts, you know, regardless of what the addiction is, if you're someone who has experienced addiction firsthand or you've seen people experience addiction, it's just, it's such a fascinating thing. It doesn't matter what the addiction is, but the one thing that is so common and is the common thread through all addiction is everyone else around you can see that you have a problem except yourself. And you, you don't think you've got a problem and you don't think anyone else around you thinks you've got a problem. And that's the one common thread. I mean, there's many common threads, but that is one common thread across all addiction. Everyone else knows you've got a problem. You don't recognize you've got a problem and you don't even think other people, you're not like self-aware enough to even realize that anyone else thinks you've got a problem. One thing I was able to recognize in the midst of my impulsive shopping tendencies was when I was getting packages on a daily basis, it was the days leading up to getting my parcel that was the, that I was on my highest high. The happiness started to slowly decline as soon as I opened it, tried it on, put it on. And it's funny because we're almost tricked to believe that that's when we'll be our happiest and maybe this is just a me thing. But it actually got to the point where I was shopping so much, I was shopping that much, that as soon as I opened the item, as soon as I opened the, the box, the package, that's when my happiness level started to slowly trickle off. It was almost like I'd made the sale, that was exciting. The the excitement, it's like a roller coaster. The excitement was raising, raising, raising. Oh my God, the, the item's been shipped. Oh my God, it's out for delivery today. Oh my God, oh my God, it's coming. Oh my God, it's at my house. Oh my God, I've opened it. I've opened it, I've tried it on. Whether or not I love or I hate it, bing, it slowly goes down. And that was an interesting emotional roller coaster that I realized I was on for pretty much every day of the week. You know, the days that I was expecting a package, that was one of the things that I would look forward to. If I was having a crap day, oh well, I'll just check my emails. How far away is that package I ordered? Is it on its way? Is it been, is it been dispatched yet? That is what was partly keeping me, you know, on this happiness roller coaster. To kind of round off this video, I wanna talk about a couple of triggers. And I would love for you to share what some other triggers you believe are, because obviously I can only speak from my personal experience. And this may, get a little bit vulnerable and a little bit icky for some of you, but I just want to be honest because if this is something I've experienced, as embarrassing and vulnerable as it is, I may not be the only one. And as I mentioned to you a little bit earlier, these are things that I've realized I'm still grappling with. And these are triggers that I've only just realized. After literally 10 years, I'm only now starting to see the warning signs. These are triggers that I think are not spoken about enough. They're not acknowledged and they're almost just ignored. They're just ignored because it's it's easier to ignore it than actually face it head on and admit it. Some of my biggest triggers that I came to realize was this void that I was trying to fill. And I've spoken about this. I was using shopping, and I think a lot of addicts use this for a variety of different, whatever their chosen poison is, but it was a void that I was trying to fill, a way to distract myself from what I was actually missing out on, what I felt like I was missing out on in life. I was trying to fill a void that truthfully was probably a little lonely. It was a little bit of a loneliness void. I think now I'm quite self-aware and I, I do have the tools and I've actually seen, seen what life is like without that impulsive shopping. So I like to think that if I have the right support around me, I will be able to manage. But what I've realized is a really big trigger, a trigger for this, is loneliness and it's also stressful situation. So this is a little bit embarrassing for me to admit, but I mean, I wouldn't say it's necessarily like a relapse, but I have found myself within the last, let's say two, three weeks, scrolling new arrivals. And that was something that I wasn't doing for like three months, guys. I wasn't scrolling new arrivals. I mean, I'm really happy to, to and I'm, I'm proud to say that I actually never had, I never went ahead and bought anything. I never went ahead and pulled the trigger on, a, on anything. I mean, any purchase whatsoever, especially impulsive things. I didn't buy anything impulsive. I only just recognized a week ago that I was scrolling new arrivals 
for the past few weeks and I actually had to sit down with myself and I realized without going into too much detail, a lot was happening for me in the month of June. Some of them I'm not obviously gonna share with you, but they were very stressful situations, situations where I felt out of control. I wasn't sure what was gonna happen. I wasn't sure what was gonna happen in the future and it was leaving me feeling very unsettled. There was a lot of stressful situations that were hanging up in the air. And other than that, turning 30, okay, it's a big, it's like a big deal, okay? Saying goodbye to my 20s, that build up, I found very, very stressful and very overwhelming. So I think those stresses, and I was able to recognize, huh, I noticed that, that pattern, I noticed that correlation of, hmm, I'm feeling stressed, I'm feeling uncertain, I'm feeling uncertain about my future and, and the future of certain situations that are going on in my life right now. I've got some, some stressful situations happening and my, my, my soothing, my comfort was scrolling new arrivals. I'm really thankful that I didn't get to the point of pulling the trigger and spending any money and buying anything, but I was able to recognize that trigger. My triggers, are loneliness, feeling lonely, and feeling stressed. <laughs> Moving forward, I'm going to have to, I don't know how long for, I'm assuming it may, I mean, I'm, I'm open to the idea it may be a, a forever thing, but I'm well aware now that this may be something that I deal with for my whole life. I may need to be aware, and I may step back, I may accidentally slip, but I need to be aware of what my triggers are and notice the triggers when they come up and notice the warning signs. But I like to think, and I'm quite positive that I will not let it overtake me again like it has in the past, because now I've, I'm aware of it. And now I've experienced feeling loved and I've experienced what it feels like to not have that void of loneliness. I will know the warning signs and I'll be able to, to have that support around me. Whether it be you guys, whether it be my family, regardless of what's going on in my life, if, if something bad happens, I need to recognize those triggers and be aware of my actions and look for that support when I need it. And I think that just goes for anybody, you know? I think a lot of people have asked me, oh my God, like, how did you stop? Like, how did you stop? For me, it came down to recognizing the, tri the triggers. And you have to be honest with yourself, you know? Like, in my darkest days, which to you guys probably look like my happiest, you know, I used to come on here and I used to unbox, 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 unbox. But what you guys didn't see was the days that I'd come home from really bad dates and collapse on my floor crying, thinking I was gonna die alone. The friendships that faded away and faded into the background, you know, I had friends that were getting into relationships I was hardly seeing anymore. I had a friend that moved, that moved overseas. One of my greatest friends that was really, made single life feel fun. She moved overseas. You know, I had a, a really sad, heartbreaking friendship breakup. I would spend most weekends, most Saturday nights, most Friday nights alone. There were points there where I was spending a lot of weekends alone. My family were worried about me. I was very much isolating myself. But you didn't know any of that. You didn't see any of that because you only saw the highlight reels of me unboxing bags and using that as a, a void filler. So that's a little bit of a personal note, but I do think that being able to recognize what those voids are in your life and finding a way to, to healthily fill them, for me it was loneliness, for me it was companionship, for me it was love. That is what I, that's what was missing. And ironically, when I, when I realized that connection, love, and purpose is actually what's missing from a lot of people's life that struggle with addiction. That's something that I realized was across the board. The common things that are missing in addicts' life, which is why they turn to a specific substance, thing, hobby, to kind of fill that void. I'd love to hear experiences and your thoughts on this in the comments down below. Have you struggled with impulsive shopping tendencies? Have you struggled with addiction? Do you, have you seen its effects on anyone in your life? I'm gonna have another one linked for you right here. If you haven't had enough of me just yet, feel free to jump over there. Thank you so much for joining me in today's video, and I'll see you in my next one. Bye.